Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you very much for coming. Uh, and before starting, I would like to say that the main objective of this visit is for me to express to the Irish government and the Irish people our deep gratitude and appreciation for the very strong support we are having uh, in our activities worldwide uh, from uh, the uh, Irish government and Irish aid. Uh, uh, a support that is more necessary than never, but a support that comes from a country, I'm a Portuguese, I can understand it perfectly, that is having enormous uh, financial problems and difficulties and is struggling to recover from a, a very complex uh, financial crisis. So uh, I think it's important to say that the support we get from, from Ireland has a value that uh, is much bigger uh, uh, when we compare with other countries that are facing a much uh, less dramatic uh, financial situation. I want to say, as I said, to the Irish uh, government, but also to the Irish people, thank you. Now, um, looking at the, 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 the new challenges of forced displacement in the world, I would like to briefly uh, say a few words uh, about three aspects. First, um, unpredictability as the norm of the present times. Second, uh, the shrinking of the humanitarian space in relation to support to the people in need uh, when moving. Uh, and third, uh, what are the trends that we can witness in relation to the causes of displacement in the near future? So first, unpredictability. If you look at uh, today's world, we have four acute refugee crises. Uh, Syria, Mali, Sudan, South Sudan, and uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. People Today, people crossing borders, fleeing conflict in these four situations. At the same time, last year, if you remember, we had Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the Horn of Africa, Libya, and Yemen. And the, the old <laughs> situations have not been solved. Uh, Afghanistan is there, Somalia is there, Colombia is there. And so uh, the international community, uh, unfortunately, uh, is showing a, a, a very limited capacity to prevent conflict, and an even more limited capacity to solve timely the conflicts that exist. What we are witnessing is a multiplication of new crises and the persistence, a resilience of the old crises that remain, of the chronic situations that remain. Um, when I started my political activities, we lived in the bipolar world. And uh, uh, when I was in office, uh, we lived in the uh, climax of the unipolar world, the U.S. as the hyperpower. Now, uh, in those periods, there was not a global governance system, much less a democratic one, but there were clear power relations. And if you look at today's world, it's no longer bipolar, it's no longer unipolar, but it's not yet structured as a multipolar world. Uh, there is no global governance system, but the power relations became unclear. And so things happen. And uh, there is no respect, uh, if I may say it in a uh, rather, uh, I mean, uh, uh, light way. Uh, and actors uh, develop initiatives in uh, ways that are totally unpredictable. Conflicts emerge, uh, situations of social unrest multiply, and there is very little capacity to control uh, the development of these events. So if you ask me what will the next crisis be, I don't know. But I know that there will be new crises, uh, probably before the end of the year or in the beginning of next year. Uh, and the capacity of the international community to minimize the impact of those crises has been considerably limited. And this, of course, represents for humanitarian actors an enormous challenge, uh, because we have to increase enormously our activity, dealing with the emergencies that we have to face, but also dealing with the old problems that were not solved and require commitment to help people and to find solutions for them um, in a moment in which resources are, of course, uh, also stretched uh, because of the difficult uh, financial situation that exists in many countries around the world and in many of the traditional donors. So uh, in an unpredictable situation uh, with a multiplication of uh, uh, challenges and uh, with a limited capacity to respond, um, those that flee conflict today um, see themselves uh, uh, in a situation in which the capacity of the international uh, system to respond to their needs is uh, uh, considerably under stress. I believe that we have been able to do what we um, we, we try to do, but uh, but I feel that 
we would need to do much more to, to be uh, fully able to respond to, to the most dramatic needs of uh, those forced to flee in the different unpredictable uh, situations that are multiplying around the world. The second dimension uh, I would like to mention is related to the shrinking of the humanitarian space. Um, if uh, uh, one looks at uh, many situations uh, we are facing, the level of insecurity uh, is also becoming more unpredictable. Uh, in the past, conflicts were or tended to be clear. There were two states fighting each other, or one government uh, under uh, the pressure of a rebel movement. And I remember going to Kilinochi to speak to the Tamil Tigers and going to Colombo to speak with the government and to negotiate um, the capacity for UNHCR to deliver support uh, uh, in the areas controlled by the two entities before the last events that led to the um, elimination of the, of the Tamil Tigers. Um, but uh, if you go to uh, many of the scenarios you face today, for instance, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, you have a national army, that sometimes is the worst perpetrator of violation of human rights, you have international forces, uh, and then you have um, um, ethnic militias, uh, you have um, um, uh, political militias, in some other areas you have religious militias, uh, uh, you have uh, groups linked to not in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but for instance in Northern Mali, groups links to global terrorist organizations. And then you have bandits. Uh, and sometimes you can be a bandit in the morning and a member of a militia in the afternoon. And, uh, uh, and it's very difficult to have interlocutors to discuss how humanitarian aid can be delivered. Even if you abide, and you need to abide by the principles of impartiality, neutrality, and independence, the problem is who are the actors that will respect those principles? For some of them, uh, the fact you are a humanitarian might make you a target, and for others, uh, they just have no way to control whatever uh, their elements do because they are just gangsters operating in an area to, uh, to make profit out of uh, the problems that uh, uh, exist uh, in that same area. Uh, so higher levels of insecurity and less predictable insecurity but also uh, shrinking of humanitarian space when governments decide uh, to restrict the access of uh, humanitarian actors because they, want, they don't want witnesses in some areas um, uh, where, for instance, uh, more dramatic violations of human rights are being perpetrated. And we all remember the stories about Darfur, and uh, we all remember the difficulties in the past about going when the cyclone Nargis um, uh, 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 occurred, how difficult it was to negotiate access to those areas. And if you look into different parts of the world, you see that in, in many regions, uh, you have uh, a lot of problems in getting permission from governments to allow you to operate in, in some areas. Again, the humanitarian space shrinks and the capacity to deliver is, is, is constrained. And then uh, I would say that uh, globally, uh, if uh, to simplify, the the responsibility to protect agenda, or the human rights agenda in general, has been losing ground to the national sovereignty agenda. And if you look at discussions in the Security Council and the paralysis of the Security Council is a good demonstration of that. And again, that has an impact on the restriction of humanitarian access to uh, many areas uh, in the world. Obviously, with people suffering and with humanitarians not being able to be present, look at Northern Mali at the present moment, uh, that means uh, um, uh, 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 not only a, a huge frustration for us, but a, a dramatic aggravation of the living conditions of the people we care for. Third element I would like to, uh, to introduce is how can we see the near future in relation to the causes of forced displacement? Now, UNHCR's mandate is clear. Uh, it is related to refugees according to the 51 Convention, which means uh, people that are victims of uh, a well-founded fear of persecution. If you want a broader definition that uh, some will fully accept, others will relegate to um, uh, subsidiary protection, people victim of conflict or persecution, let us say. Um, but we see uh, uh, more and more that it is difficult to distinguish what is a traditional pattern of migration, of someone that makes a choice to move from one country to another, aiming at a better life, um, and uh, a 
refugee that moves from one country to another because it's no longer possible to live in the first country uh, for uh, political or other uh, uh, sources of, of persecution, cultural, uh, religious, uh, or others. This distinction that was very clear in the past is becoming blurred. When you see a boat crossing from Libya into Lampedusa or from uh, uh, Obok in uh, Djibouti or from uh, Bosasso in uh, uh, Somalia into Yemen, you might find people that it is difficult to know exactly why they are moving. Uh, is the Somali moving because of the war? Is, it, is the Somali moving because of hunger last year during the summer? Uh, 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 reasons are becoming blurred. And, uh, and I believe that uh, what we are witnessing today is a growing interrelation of a number of megatrends. We have population growth. We are now 7 billion. We will be 9 billion, I think, in 2050. Um, uh, climate change, probably the defining factor of our times. Uh, I don't like to use the expression climate refugees because climate change is... Is, is a complex issue that interrelates with others. And um, uh, when we see the drought uh, in, uh, in the Sahel, it's not a new uh, thing. There has been drought in the Sahel uh, since um, we remember. But there was uh, in 2005, there was in 2010, now there is in 2012. And I mean, we see an amplification of natural disasters and many other factors. Uh, and we see climate change as an accelerator of a certain number of other elements. And then we have food insecurity, uh, water scarcity, um, urbanization. Uh, and all these megatrends are getting more and more interrelated. Um, and their impact is becoming more and more complex. Sometimes they, they are linked to problems of, uh, of uh, security uh, or of uh, political developments. Uh, urbanization plus food insecurity, rising prices of food is a, a source of social instability. Lack of water or scarcity of water in an area can be uh, a complicating factor in the relations between farmers and herders or in the conflict between two countries, for instance. Uh, the complex relationship between Tajikistan and Uzbekistan about uh, water uh, at the present moment. And so all these factors, sometimes related to conflict, sometimes by themselves, are forcing more and more people to flee. Now, if conflict is in between, uh, we can say they are refugees, uh, according to a legal definition. But if it is uh, because of natural disasters or because of uh, an environment degradation that uh, totally makes life uh, uh, impossible in a certain area. Um, uh, they have no legal definition, but they are really forced to flee. They are not also the economic migrant, the traditional economic migrant of the past. Uh, and I think that uh, Ireland in its history has a very clear situation of people forced to flee with a famine. Um, uh, they didn't leave the country because uh, um, they, they wanted to have a better life. They left the country because there was no other way, because life became impossible. And this is happening more and more in today's world. And there is no way for the international community to be prepared to respond to these challenges. And there are protection gaps, but there are also uh, other uh, very complex implications in, in societies and international relations. Um, now, uh, two countries, Norway and Switzerland, uh, uh, with the cooperation of a number of others, and hopefully Ireland will, will, will join, have launched the so-called Nansen Initiative, and uh, they, they uh, are uh, aiming at uh, a global debate on the challenges of forced displacement caused by factors that are not directly linked to the 51 Convention, and trying to find forms of uh, international cooperation or eventually um, uh, other uh, ways of responding to these and addressing the protection gaps and other problems uh, that uh, these new situations raise. Uh, again, we uh, are uh, clearly uh, sticking to our mandate. We don't want UNHCR's mandate to be enlarged. We are not uh, fighting for that. But we believe that this debate is very important. And we believe the international community needs to be prepared to face what is a a combination of factors in a world that is smaller and smaller, in which for the first time there are physical limitations to economic growth, 
and in which uh, the people on the move will be more and more a defining factor of all times. Thank you very much.